So, you want to work in a zoo? Well, you're in the right place. We're going to be talking to zookeepers, researchers, conservationists, and many more people about their careers. We will discuss how they got into doing what they do now, and of course, we'll be asking them for their advice to those that aspire to work with animals or for animals and the natural world. And we're back. So obviously we took a short hiatus last month. Uh, for those people who are listening or watching and don't know, unfortunately, we got hit with avian influenza. So it's had a bit of an effect on obviously our bird collection across the zoo. Luckily, it's had quite a minimal impact and obviously you can find out more about it on our website. There's an FAQ page. It's all over our social media and you can just get up to date with all of that. But obviously in that time we weren't able to come into the studio and use it because it was only essential staff on site. And well, now we're back to our regularly scheduled content. So but one month later we're back. One month later. Right. But I'll pass it off to you, Matt, to introduce what we're talking about today. Right, okay. So when we started this podcast, uh, we chose to talk to our younger team members as we thought that would be more easy for listeners to relate to. But for this episode, we're talking to someone who's worked with animals for a long time. Our guest today has been a keeper and a curator down at Newquay Zoo and is now in charge of our collection of reptiles, amphibians and bugs, more formally known as lower vertebrates and invertebrates. So, Ollie. Back for our first question, our <laughs> usual first question. So usual for qu first question is uh, obviously we're sat across from you, John. Yep. But if you'd just like to introduce yourself, you are John and who are you? I'm John Meek. I've, uh, I've, I've been working for the organisation for about 22 years. Mm -hmm. um, started at Keep, but before that I was a, a keeper since I was 16 years old. Oh, wow. So um, uh, I currently, I'm actually, as, uh, as said before, working with the LVI team yeah. uh, across site because we're doing more cross-site work now, which is which is really exciting, actually, and there's some mm -hmm. really interesting and exciting things going on. And so, like this job has been for the past 38, 39 years, however long I've been doing it, it's it's always something exciting going yeah. on, so uh, you never get a dull moment. Oh, right, so, John, you're curator of LVI <coughs> yep. here at Wild Planet Trust, but what's the weirdest job you've ever had? Well, it's interesting because uh, I, I haven't had that many jobs outside zoos. Okay. Um, I did... Decided when I was eight years old, um, somebody bought me a, a book, uh, which was um, Dr. Doolittle. Right, okay. Oh, amazing. Lofting. Yeah. When I was eight, and I spent the entire night reading it, and the next morning I decided what I was going to do for a living. Really? You're eight yeah, years old? And absolutely. You want to and, and, and I've, never had a, I've never had a moment since thinking okay. anything else, whether it be zookeeping or with wildlife or whatever opportunity yeah. it was going to be there. Um, told my mum and dad I was leaving home at 16. Okay. Okay. I uh, literally left home three months after my 16th birthday to, wow. to run away to join the zoo. Okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, and that's what I've been doing. I did have a little break uh, just to see what the world was about. Yeah, you know, right. To see whether it was all as good as this or, okay. or, or not. Um, about uh, 20 years ago now. Right, uh, okay. 22 years ago. And I ran a pub for about 10, 10 okay. months. Oh, was, nice. No, it was dreadful. Oh, okay. Um, okay. <laughs> It, I thought you were going to tell us a happy tale. No, then. no, I didn't. I, I, actually, it was a lovely place, and the right. people were very lovely. But it wasn't for me. It, it okay, was, it was, um, uh, yeah, it, it, odd hours and things, and yeah. didn't, didn't really suit me. Although zookeeping can be very much the same. Uh, and then I went and uh, did concrete repairing car parks, which was equally as okay. Dreadful. Okay. Um, and realised that actually the vocation I chose when I was eight years old was really what I wanted. Right. Okay. And but it's interesting actually sometimes to take a step away from what you've always known, because you think this is the greatest thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if you take a step away, you either realise it is or it isn't. Yeah. yeah. And trust me, it is. Okay. And so, so you okay. know, so I, I would, I guess with all these things, it's opportunity. Yeah. You know, and I was very lucky that um, when, I, when I gave that up, a good friend of mine uh, said, you know, there's an opportunity at, at Newquay, there's a job going. And so I went for it and got it. And so that opportunity came back. Right. So, okay. So that's how you got back into Zoo World. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And uh, so that was... That was a lucky opportunity, and I've been there ever since. Right, okay, so you're eight years old, you get yeah. this book, Dr. Doolittle, and you decide to be a zookeeper, but mm. a few years later, you actually get to toddle off to the zoo. So what collections have you worked at? Well, I worked at uh, a collection called Roadburg Gardens. I remember that. Roadburg yeah. Gardens. Tropical oh, Bird Gardens yeah. near yeah. Road. Yeah, 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 I remember that. Right. I was <laughs> there for 11 years, uh, uh, and I worked in, in uh, various other collections but mainly oh, I worked in a private collection in Devon as well for a, okay. that's where I stepped yeah. away from road because I've been at road since so I was um, 16 right and I'm looking there. after birds because it was a special it was the biggest birds. collection of birds I've ever seen or ever heard of it was yeah. colossal and um, I was head keeper there for about five years five six years 
Um, and it was phenomenal. It was incredible. But it was the days when um, there was lots of trading birds and, and, and other animals yeah. as well. And, it, it, you know, the world and zookeeping has changed massively and for the benefit, and for, you know, for the good now. Um, but those days we did have a huge collection. And nowadays with, with, with collections of animals, it's not about having a huge collection. It's yeah. having a very targeted collection. Yeah. And that's really important. Um, right, because we don't want one of every species here. We're trying to work absolutely. with a few species that either we really need to breed here or that we can tell an interesting story about the projects we're doing overseas. Or absolutely. And I think that, that you know we have a bit of a mantra that is do less, better. Yeah. So yeah. You know, do it really well, exhibit it really well, do the conservation. And uh, in those days it was how many species can we have and how, you know, <laughs> can, we, can we see this animal and this animal? And, and, and those... It wasn't very productive, and it certainly it wasn't conducive to conservation in any way. Yeah. But it was an incredible learning curve because uh, some of the things you learnt with animals coming straight in from the wild, which thank goodness the bird band came in because it, you know in those days it was it, it wasn't good. So when you were working at the road bird gardens, mm. you would have had birds literally being caught from the wild for display in captivity. Absolutely, and, that, and that's the way things were forty years ago, yeah. uh, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, not always, because we bred a lot, and it was yeah, you know, yeah. we, we, we learned a lot from it. But a lot of the skills, a lot of a lot of the kind of um, the keeper skills, yeah. come from that era. And and you know, it's always good to have, you know, the older generation. And, and there's a couple of really good guys at Newquay, and I'm sure there's some really good guys here as well. In fact, I know there are. I've got some great guys in my team. Um, You've just got the knack. Who, with well, they, they, yeah, and and they just you know they know what to do. And, yeah. and you know, if you get a problem, whether it be a health problem or a safety problem or anything like that, you know the guys to call on. You know, yeah. you, and it's really useful now when those things happen and when we do a drill to actually have the junior keepers and trainee keepers to actually stand back and watch. Yeah. It's really yeah. interesting how they respond. So those skills were, were really built up. And, and I know, knew then a lot of people from other zoos. And so we all had that kind of skill set. Yeah. Um, so you're 16, like literally yeah. toddle off to bird gardens yeah, at Road. Lived in a caravan. I was going to say, were you living in like a shared house? <laughs> no, so a caravan. It's it a dreadful place. <laughs> sweeping out enclosures, changing water bowls, filling a lot of bowls Absolutely. of seed. I, I do remember um, one of my jobs for quite a few years in the middle of winter was breaking ice on waters okay. for most of the day. Was <laughs> in the middle of winter, which was... Uh, Glamorous world of I, I, I Do you know, I say that an awful lot to, to keepers when they're walking around in the, you know, Throw in rain and stuff. Yeah, like yeah. I'm saying glam, isn't it? Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's just not. Um, but it's uh, yeah. So I mean, it, but but that's the same with anything. You know, if if you went to work in a factory, you were given you know the the lowest job to begin. Yeah. You build yourself and work yourself. Up yeah. If you if you've got a passion for it, um, and actually nowadays, uh, when we're taking apprentices on or or new keepers or whatever, um, it's not like that, and and it's really good now that, that, that they have a lot of training and, and formal training as well as um, you know training along with the along with the staff as well. Yeah. Both of those are really important, um, and it's all about having the passion. If you've got the yeah. passion, you're going to learn, and you know that's always the way, isn't it? That uh, if you go into any zookeeper's house, yeah. there isn't a bookshelf empty. You know, they've mm. all, and they've all got you know books on animals, and that because that's where their passion lies. Yeah. If you've got the passion, you'll learn. Um, and so even in those days, you know, you really, you know, I could tell you all the species of Amazon, 16 species of Amazon parrot, and, you know, I knew all of them because you were really passionate. Yeah. About it. Okay. Uh, so, so like, no, yeah, we see that in the keepers that we've interviewed, some of the younger guys that yeah. we've interviewed, they're, they're all like Google scholar alerts and they're all looking on different groups and whatnot and doing research. Yeah. 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 yeah they yeah. all know the scientific names and everything. Absolutely. It's yeah. impressive. Yeah. So you've worked with uh, birds, obviously. That was and my, main, the, my main thing was birds. When okay. I was, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, what other animals have you worked with? Have you worked with mammals? And yeah, I'm, I'm, obviously, uh, certainly in Newquay, yeah. uh, I was creator over the whole site right, for okay. 20 odd years. So we, and we, we, Newquay we, has yeah. lions, lynx. Lions, lynx, the, all the civets, the big hoof stock, all that kind of thing. The, when we first, uh, well, I was there from 2000. And the trust took it over in 2003. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and from there on in, we drove it forward um, with new enclosures and new species and everything right. else. And I don't think there's any species there that were there before me. Right. Okay. Or certainly no animals there yeah. that were there before me. Scariest animal you've worked with? Oh, um, one of my favourites, actually. Uh, individual or, or...? Yeah, individual. Yeah, we had, a, we had a guy called Lazar who was a black wildebeest. Right, OK. okay. Um, Hold on, so you work with lions, but they're black wildebeest. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. But, well, yeah. But he was... The thing is, um, Lazar was 
he was amazing. We brought I, I brought Black World of Eastern from Czech Republic yeah. because we yeah. would see them there, and we just thought that actually potentially they could be new bloodlines of the wild animals, and there was issues. Anyway, so we decided to work with Black World of Eastern, which was brave. Um, <laughs> and when we first got them, uh, the guy from the Czech Republic came over, and he we had two males, two females, <clears throat> and he chased them down the corridor into the into the stalls, which was <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah, on your own there. Um, and I always remember him speaking to Roger, the keeper down there, and, and Roger said, uh, are they dangerous? Oh, yes. He said, uh, will they attack you? Oh, yes, yes. And then he just walked away. And that was right. it. So, and, but Lazar was, um, was particularly aggressive because that's the yeah. way they are. Yeah. Okay. But if you went there, he would attack the mesh at you and he'd attack the sides right, and everything okay. else. And I just thought they were pretty honest. Like, slightly... Daft animals who no, just been around. No, no, they're mainly. <laughs> no. I mean, oh, okay, okay. right. No, um, but he was the, the, the thing. He didn't go in with him, so yeah. it wasn't unsafe. Obviously, yeah. you know, we have very strict protocols for those sort of things. And he, but he was honest. Yeah, you know, he was an animal that that would, if you went up to him, he'd smash he'd smash the the mesh. Right. And, okay. And, and you knew. So you had no doubts that he. Yeah, no, he wasn't, was not friendly. He wasn't sly in any way. Okay. He was absolutely honest. But okay. I think he was probably the most overtly sort of. Um, Dangerous animal, I suppose, okay. but he was wonderful. I loved him. He was just, <laughs> he was just amazing. Right. So you're a curator, officially someone who cares for a collection. Mm-hmm. Okay. What does that actually mean day to day? Like, what's your job? Okay. So uh, most of it is is I feel that my job is making sure that the keep to facilitate the keepers' jobs. Yeah. So making sure they have the tools, whether that be training or whether that be, um, you know, the physical tools to do the job, mm-hmm. whether that be enough staff or whether that be you know enough finance to be able to do the job yeah. and then giving a sort of overall direction and, and, and overview of where we're going forward and okay. how we can get things done and, and firefighting to a degree if there's if there's problems and stuff and making sure they're backed up so I think it, it actually as a manager regardless of curator or whatever one else you call I just think it's my job to facilitate them doing yeah. this okay so you're helping the keepers to keep yeah, I think so. Helping because, them guide you know, them you're only as good as your team and, yeah. and you know it, it, I'm lucky I've landed a fantastic group and um, so it's just for me really to, to facilitate that and then that, that you know I'm almost a go-between so I work from you know higher levels yeah um, right from our um, CEO down um, and, and making sure that those ideas and, and aspirations are achieved in a timely manner and yeah. also obviously the safety side which you know all joking aside is is incredibly important and yeah. actually um, those things have to be yeah so I know that your team here will look after animals like Komodo's mm-hmm. Uh, which are dangerous lizard. Yep. So, uh, you know, obviously safety is a concern there. Mm-hmm. But I was just thinking then when we talked about you working at uh, another collection and wanting like one of every species mm. at that collection, then here we're actually choosing to n- not look after certain species anymore. So mm. um, that, that's always the way and things evolve. Um, I think that with, with conservation programs and areas of the world, we've been discussing various species that, that come from the areas that we work in. So yeah. we have yeah. conservation projects in Vietnam and various other places. So it, we're almost targeting that. And that's all down to collection planning, uh, mm-hmm. which we just we have been through. And we, 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 it's a constant evolving thing that we, we discuss all yeah. the time. Um, so actually, it's not just having an animal in a box for the no. sake of it. And in fact, that's going to get certainly on my part. And I know the other guys are working very hard on it as well. It, it, it's going away from that and, and actually yeah. targeting what we do and making sure the species we keep are there for a reason. And that can be educational, that can be direct conservation yeah. um, and, and various other reasons. But it, the collection plan has a lot of criteria on it yeah. and, and they have to hit certain criteria to be able to yeah. get that animal, not just we want to get an animal in a box because it's pretty, that's gone. So what is the rarest species you work with? Um, oh my goodness, I've worked with... Thousands of species. Okay. Um, the one that sticks in my mind, and I think probably it, it, whether it's the rarest, um, it, it'll be up there with them. Yeah. Um, and the ones that I felt, somebody asked me what was what was the most significant moment, which I guess is related, are the ice and civets at, at Newquay. Right. Mm-hmm. right. Okay. Um, so that's a small, spotty, cat-like animal that lives in yeah, Vietnam. Yeah, it's a mustelid. Yeah. Okay. And, and we did. I'm very proud to have gone to some of the meetings in, in Vietnam about conservation of this species. Yeah. And and to meet up with some unbelievable conservationists, both native Vietnamese and, and Europeans and, and Americans and stuff, really targeting this particular species. 
um, and what Why, can do cause, about just because it. it's ignored or what? It's just been missed. No, no. Uh, I think it was. It, it, they, you know, the numbers have gone down. Yeah. and they're, they're becoming rare. They're not a targeted species. It's a species that they're caught in snares and, and yeah. traps yeah. and stuff. You know, almost as bycatch, but they do eat them if they, if they get yeah. them. Yeah. Um, it hasn't got any medicinal qualities like a lot of the yeah. variations have. Um, but we bred them reasonably well. Uh, early part of and we brought the first ones ever out of Vietnam into collections in Europe and, and the idea was to have an, you know, a population outside of Vietnam yeah. um, and at one point we bred several and we sent two back to Vietnam Right, okay. amazing they went back to the, the, the conservation centre there but just to have those pictures back of the boxes arriving in Vietnam yeah. with two of my civets okay. uh, you know, back in yeah. the country of origin and it, you just kind of think if I could do that with every species, that we are, yeah, I, I'd, I'd happily do. I, I think Gerald Durrell says the idea of this is to is to do us out of a job. Yeah, you know, we, yeah. we, we don't want, you know, we, we would rather not have to do this. Yeah, I thought um, you were going to say that's... like I don't know, Sakura dove or <clears throat> Anam leaf turtle. You know, one of the we've got several species here that are you know really. Yeah. Oh yes, no, absolutely. Yeah. There, there, there are, as you said, I mean, yeah. how, how long a list do you want? There's an awful lot, <laughs> lot of. You know a lot of species that we can work with but i think the reason i picked up on that one purely was that that was the one we actually we actually did send yeah. something back and 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 i i just think that that was quite a significant moment i mean we've worked with java green magpie mm -hmm. as well down there and uh, you know a lot of the species we keep so yeah i mean i think the the idea of to say what's the rarest is is often difficult anyway yeah i, mean, I, I stub it for zara zaguti and the um uh Data deficient, and right. I remember one of our directors saying that that could be the rarest animal we've got. We just don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, because it's data deficient. So, right. Know. Because with some species, like with the Ariston civets, it's really hard to count. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 We, we don't know what the population is, yeah. um, and so therefore, you know, to, to answer which is the rarest, is, yeah, difficult, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And just to interject, before we go into another question, just yeah. so people know as well, that's Save Vietnam's Wildlife, isn't yes, it? Yes, Save Vietnam's Wildlife, um, yeah. And if people are wondering how to look into that or how to support mm. them at all or anything like that, you can do so through us. It's on our website, and you can also search their website, and they've got a newsletter, really informative. It shows you all the different mm. things that they're doing. They also do work with pangolins and things like that as well, so really cool little resource if you're yeah. into your Vietnam Yes, yeah, so it's, uh, really, it's, it's an amazing place. Yeah. It's, it's in Cuc Vong National Park, and uh, the opposite side of that is the um, turtle centre as well. Yes. And, okay. and we're actually talking about um, species that they're, they're also working with over there for our zoos now, so that's looking into for the future. Right. Well, if you can't answer the question of what's the rarest animal <laughs> you work with, then no, I can. No, can I mean. you tell us, do you have a qualification in animal keeping? No. Um, I've, a, a, as I said, I left school at 16. Yeah. I think in those days, and I'm feeling very old saying all this, um, then the qualifications weren't so important. No. Um, certainly as I've gone through, I've qualified, but not in, in animal care as such. Right, Because okay. actually my experience in animals was, was such that my skill set was actually more lacking in staff. Yeah, okay. Mm, uh, you know, uh, management techniques and things like okay. that. And so you're going to tell me that you're qualified in like HR, but no. you're not qualified <laughs> to look after an animal. Yeah, yeah, well, okay. it's, uh, yeah, animals are easy. Fair enough. <laughs> so if you were, like, talking to somebody who's at school at the minute or maybe looking at a career change, mm. like, what qualifications do you see at the minute or what training do you see at the minute that would be, that you'd be thinking, oh, yeah, that's what I would be interested in? Well, I think there's two, two ways of going, it seems to be at the moment, there's the academic side of things. And, yeah. and you know, going to university, getting a degree yeah. in in one of the biological sciences, and, and that depends on what course you, you can get. Actually, um, there isn't, to my knowledge, a really positive zoo-based yeah. degree, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so any of the sciences is, is good. But also there's the uh, apprentice scheme. That, so if you're not as academic or you're not interested in the ac academia as much, then then maybe that's the way to go. And that seems to be really good now, and that gives you a qualification, yeah. um, as well as a, a practical experience on, on the ground. And we, we've taken a, a few guys on, and that's, that seems to be coming back in now. The government brought that in a year or two ago. And um, that, that works very well, I think, because okay. people can make a start on that um, and come in and do a two-year it does, apprenticeship. It does allow, right? So when we chatted to the keepers for a, mm. a podcast episode earlier in the series then 
uh, some of the some of them had look, Rihanna had, had studied at university mm. and had had studied conservation and then gone into keeping, yes. whereas others had gone into keeping and then absolutely gradually got qualified. Yeah. So that like, you think it either route well, may think, be appropriate. Yes, I think so. And it all depends on, you, on, on your own thought processes. And, yeah. and maybe you're not as am- academic as some, and therefore it wouldn't suit you to do that. So therefore there, are, there is another way yeah. in. And I think that's important because often a lot of the people you get working in zoos, it's all about passion yeah. and work ethic because you know you have to be able to, to, to put yourself out and, and you know if you've got an animal coming in at 8 o'clock at night, you know, and all that, that that's about work ethic and having that passion for yeah. what you yeah. do. Um, and so, therefore, it would be a shame if we just said you have to have X qualification to do that job because actually you're missing out on a lot of people with a lot of passion that actually mm. may, may, maybe haven't had that opportunity. Yeah, but and who so, would have the knack and the commitment to yeah, uh, be and, looking and, at Yeah, and then they can qualify. I mean, there used to be, well, there still is, I think, uh, uh, qualifications for the, the um, uh, Zoo Animal Management course, yeah. what I think yeah. it's called. It's been cool, replaced right? and changed, but there's various yeah. um, sort of FE colleges that offer. Yeah, so the, there was that, that, that that was the sort of standard um, zoo, zoo qualification. Yeah. So keepers would come in, but you know, you could only do that once you're employed by a zoo. So you come in, you get that qualification. The positive thing about uh, zoo work now is that when I was much younger, it was almost you're a keeper, so you just muck out and that's what you do. But actually, the and one thing I have to say about this organisation, which I think is fantastic, is the in-house, not only qualification, but training. Yeah. Um, mm. And the opportunities, the, 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 the latest um, uh, incantation of it with the, um, the uh, what it's called now, the training yeah. hub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, which, to me, looks fantastic and is targeted at certain people with certain skills and stuff. So actually, the in-house training can be really important. Um, and nowadays you have to be a little bit of a jack of all trades. I've had to take an Irish course from health and yeah. safety and things yeah. like that. Um, and certainly I would, if I was a keeper starting now, I would be wanting to do all of those things. Yeah. Because I think if you've got a, a health and safety course, you've got a management course, that gives you the opportunity to move up because it's not all about animal skills. Yeah. It's all about people skills and safety skills and all those things. Yeah, um, yeah that's true. I, I suppose I when that's, we've... that's really important. So there's a lot of in-house training once you get in there. That gives the people who've done the apprenticeship and yeah. not necessarily the academic qualification a real opportunity to, to better themselves. And yeah, I suppose when we've talked to other people about getting experience in places, one thing we mm-hmm. haven't really covered is that when you're working or helping a big collection, that they are likely just to be able to have the resources to train you yeah. Yeah. better. You know, the, the small collections are going to be able to give you experience on a lot of different animals, but yeah. a bigger collection maybe will give you a different. So no, that's, that's very possibly. true. Some some of the smaller uh, uh, organisations won't have those sort of uh, resources to be able to, to be able to do that, and that's understandable. Um, but my advice would be that you go and find that. I think that you know you you get a lot of experience with. The, there's always a lot of talk about guys with lots of experience, yeah. and and some of the people I've worked with have got 30 40 years experience and there's no doubt about it they're the guys to go to yeah, yeah. um and you know they can often be difficult because they know and it's quite interesting <laughs> it's quite interesting when you see young guys come in uh and they and they and they come in and, and uh we had a, i was remember i mentioned there was a young lady who came and decided i think we should change all this hoof stock stuff and <laughs> and uh the hoof stock keeper went now all those ideas you just had i've had as well and they didn't work you know right, so okay. so but that's a really good good thing uh, uh, for experience for people because trust me most of the time we've already thought that through and that didn't work or you know whatever there's no reason you shouldn't have good ideas but um yeah you know when you've got people who've been doing it a lot of years then yeah you know they've been there and done that and made that mistake Mm -hmm. um so that that you know in a way there's kind of three three things here really you've got the academic qualification which to me just proves that you've really got the, the staying power and, and, and the, the sort of thoroughness to get through it. So yeah. that's a big thing, even if whatever qualification it is, if you get a degree, you've worked hard at it. Um, there's the apprenticeship and then there's the practical experience on, on site. Yeah. Um, and I think those three things are really valuable, whichever direction you go or two out of the three. This podcast is brought to you by Wild Planet Trust, a conservation charity based in the southwest of the UK with zoos in Paynton and Newquay local and national nature reserves and field projects in the UK, Tanzania, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Vietnam and Sulawesi. You can find out more on our website www.wildplanettrust.org.uk Right, so changing tack a little bit, what's the best thing about your job? Uh, 
I, I, do you know, the, strangely enough, the longer I go on doing this, um, the more I agree with why I started it, really. It is, it is actually working with the animals. Okay. You know, without doubt, um, when I come over here to go down to those giant tortoises and check them out in the morning, and, <laughs> you know, yeah. they, they're just amazing creatures. And, and, you know, they never cease to amaze you. And I, I, I just think sometimes you just think, I'd really like to get back and do that, uh, the keeping stuff. But yeah. on the other hand, I think I'm, I'm actually enjoying change yeah um i'm enjoying the way the zoo world is changing um certainly that was fun back then but actually i think that it really is going in the direction that i believe in which is the conservation side and do less better yeah um and since i changed jobs to do the lbi job from from new key it's been a real challenge and it's been really nice because i just think you can do the same job all your life and it can get you know, yeah. Yeah. same and you carry on and, and, and you end up not affecting the change that you would like to do. But now I've been, I've been very lucky and been given an opportunity where I can affect a bit more change and we can we can move forward and do things, you know, better. Yeah. Um, actually and, work with the species we want to. and uh, Yeah, and actually the team as well. And I think that's the thing. It, 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 to work with the species, you have to put the team together. And that, that's what I'm trying to do is actually put, a, you know, a, yeah. put a team together. The team have been fantastic, but add to that. Um, and and see if we can get a really good team cross sites, you yeah. know, yeah. both sites, and and see if we can get them working together, and then that will drive what we really want to do. Because if you've got a team of people, I can't do it on my own by yeah. any means. And and you've got the right team of people around you, we can really affect change, um, and we can rebuild some of these enclosures, and we can redo what we want, and we can change the collection plan and and move it forward. So it's it. I think it's really exciting times for the trust, and and, and I appreciate that we've had the bird flu and various things mm-hmm. in the past. Everybody has the challenges, but we just have to move forward. And I yeah. think I think I think the will and the and the drive is here to do so, which is quite exciting. So actually, yeah. I think if you ask me, the best thing about the job is the future. Really, it's, okay. it's where we're going and how we're going to get there. Right. So, what's the worst bit about the job? In what job? <laughs> yeah, what tasks antithesis. on a day are you most happy to palm off on somebody, <laughs> on somebody else, else in your team? Well, I, I, I could say a few, I could say a few things, but the, yeah, okay, um, yeah. It, so th- there is a lot of Paperwork that is um, okay. <laughs> paperwork not, right. not, okay. not the most fun, um, but we have to do it. You know. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really sort of pleased that if you go into any meeting now, and I was in a keeper meeting the other day, the first thing on the agenda, health and safety. What's, yeah. what's happened, and that's really good, and I think that's really important that we've come back to that. It's dull, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it's really important. It is, but it doesn't but smell. What, when we no, ask the keepers, what no, job are you true. most happy to leave to other people on your team? One of them said clearing out the drains because yeah, that was the that, that's least favourite job. Not the best fun. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think that the, the worst job I've ever had is we. This was many years ago. We had a freezer go down. And oh, it was full of oh, okay. and everything else. Okay. And, yeah. and it just stopped. And we had to get it cleared out, and we it was a weekend or something, and we had to get um, a company in to clear it out yeah. <laughs> because okay. it was just unpleasant. Yeah. Um, and so we just shut the door and said, hopefully it'll stay cold. Little did we know that the motor in there had started to blow warm air. Oh, no. So when we opened the freezer, <laughs> it was the most disgusting thing I've ever seen in my life because okay. uh, it was several days later. So there are some jobs that you just think, yeah. oh, no. You, you, <laughs> I'm you glad know. I palmed that one off on well, somebody but else. But the thing is, you, you have to do the advanced buck passing course, really. That's one of the courses, isn't it? Just <laughs> see if you can get away with it. But on the other hand, sometimes you've got to go, do you know what, guys? I'll muck in with you. Yeah, yeah. In your mind, you're going, no, I don't want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. But even then, it, the practical stuff is, is, is you know, it, that's fine. Um but you know, some of the paperwork is dull. Yeah, yeah. But necessary, necessary. Yeah. Necessary. If you want to move an animal internationally that's endangered, a you lot know, of then paperwork. there's going to be a lot of paperwork. There is a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of paperwork for, for moving animals, and I, I think what a lot of people don't understand is the amount of animal moves yeah. that are going on at any one time in zoo. It seems to have slowed up considerably because yeah. of Brexit. Brexit. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also, you know, with the bird flu recently, that's obviously made it difficult. But that's really important for our conservation work, though, right? Very Having much healthy, so. very animals. much so. And and all these animals have got to be, you know, genetically right. So you know, if if we have a, um, we're working with Fiji Island iguanas at the moment, and, yeah. and but the correct animals have to come in genetically yeah. to breed with each other. So that may be one from Germany and one from Scotland. You know, yeah. so that that often happens, and uh, so there's a lot of work involved with that and organisation and things because transporting animals is obviously, you know. It, it's it's an art and it's a science. So you have to get it right oh, definitely. because yeah. of the, the animals and the paper, not only the paperwork, but actually the welfare of the animals in transit. I take your point about the um, animals being often what you go back to when, in terms of giving yourself a uh, sort of you know, benefit of the job. Mm. Like for me, 
yesterday I was working at my desk and I was fed up. I've been dealing with something with <laughs> Stuff you training or paperwork. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, right, okay, I'm just going to go and see an animal. So I stepped out of the office and that's a rare job where you get to just mm. do that. But can you think, like, people don't go in, but we're a charity and you don't go into charity work to make big money. So yeah. there's certain sacrifices. But what are the other sacrifices that go with 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 the job the career that you've had like so you've been a keeper and a curator but what, like some people say yeah like, I mean you hours? don't you you wouldn't do it for money um, you'd be an idiot really yeah because <laughs> you know since I've, t- I've taken this latest incantation of my career on I've I've started to take weekends off but that's the first time in my life right uh, okay and you know that was and it, it it was always full on because of the passions there and you wouldn't leave anything and you wouldn't do anything and and sometimes there was a lot of travelling. Um, which is dreadful, isn't it? But, <laughs> oh no! What a <laughs> around the world, you know. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so th- there is a lot of time away from home, and and obviously with animals, you never it, 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 they don't only work nine to five. So yeah. often you're out late. You had animals coming in late and things yeah. like that. I've missed birthdays and, and you know stuff that because you you wouldn't leave them. Yeah, Christ- and, Christmas Day is a classic one that a lot of oh, zookeepers. Yes, like when I was a kid, my yeah. brother was a zookeeper, and Christmas Day he would often be working, and yep. it's just it's it's. Animals still need to be fed Absolutely. every day of the week. Every, every day of the week, and and you know it's it's uh, it's interesting that you mentioned Christmas Day because that's the, it's actually one of the nicest days because everybody yeah. just comes in and brings you know sort of mince pies and, yeah. and stuff like that, and it's quite nice. And everybody kind of works together. So if somebody lives a little way away, they get them away quickly and this yeah. sort of thing. But um, yeah, it, it, that's exactly it. And and you know if you've got kids and stuff, I've got three children, and uh, well, not children anymore, but. Um, you know, so the, those things are are often sacrificed. I don't think it's any worse than being a farmer, okay, or maybe a long distance lorry driver is away from home and okay. things like that. So I, I think that those sort of things are, are um, you know, if you're passionate about it, it's what you do. Yeah. So we support conservation projects around the world. We've already mentioned Vietnam, but which project would you most like to visit? Oh, that's a question. That's not one I've even yeah. thought about, actually. Uh, I'd quite like to go and see Selamat Kenyaki, which is our okay, project Sulawesi. that we support you know, in Sulawesi, that, that was the, in that, Indonesia. That was probably the one I was thinking as well, okay. because I know uh, a colleague of mine went out there a, a couple of years ago, and that's a species that I've worked with that I don't anymore. But yeah. So Sulawesi crested black macaques, they're yes. critically endangered monkey that we have a, uh, a community and education project that we support in Indonesia mm. that's working to basically try and protect the forest and um, give people new careers when they were previously hunting. Mm. So Yeah, it's, so it would be a really to... interesting project, I think, to go out and see because there's a lot of species out there that are really interesting as well. And, and you know, that I, I know when Dave went out, it was it was challenging, I think, to get out there. I mean, I've been I've been to the Vietnamese project several yeah. times and that, that that's extraordinary. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's probably the one I would go to because I just think that, you know, it, it was a challenging time for him to get out there. And, and sometimes when you look at these conservation projects, you think, well, the, 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 there's a conservation issue there for a reason. And that's not because it's always stable and easy yeah, places yeah. To, to live in and work in. And, 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 you know, conservation or wildlife preservation is often way down the line. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, we live in a very rich and very affluent and very easygoing country, however much yeah. we complain about it. Um, and so it, it's interesting to, to see some of these other places so. and cultures. Well, you're not allowed to choose Sulawesi uh, somewhere can, yeah, because I chose it. So that's where <laughs> I want to visit. But so, so I'll make you choose one of our other projects. No, so where else? Sorry, yeah. <laughs> right. Everywhere, please. Yeah. What's oh, technically you. tricky about your job? So. Um, I think the... the Technically tricky about the current job, actually, yeah. which is quite is quite well, interesting. Uh, I think maybe just actually it could be just looking just after generally. looking after LVI animals, so reptiles and amphibians. Yeah, and, and actually that is, is the most technical um, piece of the organisation yeah. animal wise. Yeah, because actually uh, I'd like to point out every keeper will say that their section is the most difficult to work yes, on. Yes, but they're but wrong. You mean, right, so yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I've, I've, I've done them all. So um, I think the. The reason for that is that it was interesting. I was having a conversation about aquatics with somebody the other day and, yeah. and life support systems. And interestingly, that the, if you're looking after aquatics, fish and, and yeah. aquatic amphibians and stuff, you don't actually look after the animals too much. You're looking after the Kit. environment. Yeah, you, yeah. You look at it, the, the water quality is all. So you're actually you're actually looking after water. Uh, <laughs> That's you know, a good way of looking at it. You know, that because you are you're looking, making sure that the, the water quality is right. And so technically, it's quite difficult. We've uh, luckily um, we've got some very good people, and we're bringing more 
people on board with technical ability when it yeah. comes to new UV lighting, yeah. new heating, um, and certainly uh, water quality issues and life support systems. And yeah. that's that's something that I'm really interested in and something we need to drive forward because there's a lot more research and technology now about how you light and how you heat these animals yeah. and, and actually you know regulation um allowing the animals to, to, to regulate in and out of heat areas and, and stuff like that yeah um, there's been some big research advances right in husbandry yeah. of reptiles and actually i was just thinking that the things like the uv lighting that have been becoming the norm in reptile mm. husbandry is now starting to carry over into other very much so groups, i think they're right, using so. it in calatrichids and and, and various That's monkeys primates and various, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> all monkeys and things um and actually birds as well yeah, yeah. i know they, they, they're putting in uv lighting in, in birds because a lot of the thing is a lot of these animals come from the tropics yeah come from equatorial land which yeah. is which is you know um 12 and 12 and it, it's very strong uv um it was very interesting this year i did some work with a uv meter outside in yeah. our country in the middle of august you know and, yep. it's, it's July and the result was the result was a lot lower than i thought it was going to be oh, okay um and you know some of the uv lights are given off more uv than i could i could find right even okay. in the middle of the day. Oh, so, wow. so it just kind of proves that the northern countries don't um I, I, the uv is not as not as yeah. effective yeah. as it is in equatorial countries so i asked this question about technical trickiness mm. i suppose to highlight that i know you said this earlier but a lot of people think of a zookeeping as mucking out sweeping yeah, out yeah, and absolutely. actually especially on certain sections there's a lot of a lot more technicality to it than yeah you and i think nowadays that that research has to be there and i yeah. think that, that it, you know if you've got rhinos yes there's a lot of dung shoveling yeah um <laughs> But if you're the kid who's at school and the careers teacher is saying, well, you need to study maths because you'll need to know this. Actually, sometimes you do need to be able to absolutely. figure out the instruction like yeah. manual. for a Yeah, absolutely. And and that research is really key. You really need to know what you're doing. And um, with with new UV systems and, you know, filtration systems and all things like that, certainly on the LVI department, a lot of it is looking after the life support systems. And yeah. by, by that, I mean... You know the air quality, the yeah. water quality, the the, the the lighting quality, and things like that. And with a lot of uh, amphibians that that you know, and, and reptiles that they they don't do a lot, they don't poop a lot. They yeah. You know, yeah. Um, <laughs> once, and, once a week is not yeah, so bad. Yeah, that's right. That, so <laughs> actually, the mucking out is not that; it's that humidity level and that and that. And so keeping that environment right yeah. is really key. And also social dynamics and things. You know, so you know we can put four tortoises in an enclosure but three of them are male that female's getting you know yeah it, it, getting yeah harassed and, and all those kind of things that you really have to be aware of and a lot of that is technical a lot of that is is slowly watching that you know I've, I've had a lot of keepers kind of think well i feel rotten if i'm stood about well you're stood about observing that animal yeah you know you need for to a know purpose. what's going on you know yeah. and that's where we also find that students and, and and research students things like that are really key because they are they're, they're there you know, if you want the giant tortoises watched and, and they're there watching them six hours a day, yeah. by God, they can see the environment, the, 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 the movement and how things are moving in there. And that's really, really important. Yeah. So. Okay, like that's good, quite a good example because your one of your uh, head keepers was chatting to me recently about the um, giant tortoises and about them getting jealous of each other. And I just, <laughs> I thought for a moment, <laughs> I was like, I have never thought of a giant tortoise getting jealous. So very interesting research. Well, I think the thing is, if you've got, I don't know, a gorilla or an antelope or something. Yeah. It chases each other and does yeah. all that. And you can see all that stuff. But with giant tortoises, and there's only my observation, they appear to have real subtle uh, ways. I mean, I've, I've observed them before now actually going, you put a pile of food in, they go and sit on the food right. until the other one goes away. And then they get off the food and eat it. So it's just, okay. Yeah, so, okay. You know, so it's just, he thought about that. You know, yeah. and, uh, so there's little subtle ways of... of, of the way they respond, <laughs> okay, which so. means they're actually thinking about um, another animal's like intention that's quite interesting it's really <laughs> interesting yeah and you d i don't know how much sort of how much they know about that but it, it's interesting to watch the behavior yeah. and you just kind of think it lives 160 years yeah. it's learning something you know yeah. so it's you know i've learned for, lived 48 years and learned nothing there we go <laughs> right i've got a couple of questions just to yeah, finish yeah. off so um for this one i would like as brief an answer as possible okay. which is that uh what's your personal favorite animal what's your sort of passion project what, what have you got on your wall at home like a picture of like what's your favorite animal i mean I, i've been asked that many times over the years and it all changes it used to be mm -hmm. secretary birds and it was black wildebeest and things like that now i'm working with lvi actually i think that the, the, some of the really interesting stuff is uh, is some of the crocodilians which i think we okay. we work with here and and 
trying to manage those and trying to get those right. We've got the croc house here and we're looking at various other things to do. Um, and so that's quite a nice challenge. Okay, crocs. Fair okay, enough. I'm going to go right. with crocs for now. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah, you had to be brief, didn't you? And yeah. if you weren't working in conservation, what would you do? Uh, retire. Okay. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I think, I Fair think, enough. I, I think if the opportunity, and it's all about opportunity. Mm. Now, if the opportunity wasn't to work um, in conservation, then I would be doing some on the side. I'd work for yeah. you know, some concert, a, a voluntary, in a voluntary yeah. way of some description and probably drive a van. Okay. Quite fancy driving a van. I've always yeah. thought driving a van would be cool. It's just easy, isn't it? Yeah. Radio 2. Oh, just yeah. drive a van. Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> okay. And Ollie, I think you've got one last question. What would your advice be for your 15-year-old self? You're looking at advice if they want to do this for a living? Yeah. Is that what yeah. you're saying? I think is to get the passion. Read up. See where your skill set sits. If you if you have the academic um, nice to actually go off to university, do that. I think that's a life-changing mm-hmm. thing to do as well as anything else. You gain some maturity, yeah. plus you get the qualification. If you don't feel that's right, then look for opportunities um, for uh, apprenticeships or volunteering. Often volunteering is a good thing because we, we found lots of good people through volunteering. And, yeah. And you know, we do one day a week and we can see the passion there. Read up, know what you're talking about. When you walk in, you know what that animal is. You know, that's, and that's, you, you can pick the passionate ones out. Uh, so obviously we talked about a lot of different things. Uh, we talked about moving animals. I'll just remind everyone that we did talk to Sarah, our registrar of animal moves and whatnot. So there is a podcast where we've spoken to her. You can learn more about animal moves. Talked about Save Vietnam's Wildlife. You can find out more on their website and our website and Salamat Kanyaki, along with all the other projects that we do. But for now, that is it with uh, John here. I'm sure you've got lots thank of you. other important meetings on this afternoon. So thank you for your time. Thank you. And we'll pleasure. hopefully talk to you again soon. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for listening or watching our podcast. If you enjoyed it, please consider leaving us a review or if you're watching, please hit the like button and leave us a comment about your favorite part of the episode. To get more content from Wild Planet Trust, please consider checking out our YouTube channel. You can subscribe there and you can also subscribe to our newsletter on our website. Of course, you can find Wild Planet Trust, Paint and Zoo and Nuki Zoo on all main social media platforms and we'd really appreciate you checking those out as well. All that's left to say is thank you very much for watching and of course we'll see you in the next episode.